Acts chapter 2 is for all of the redos and the undones. The redos and the undones. You know, the, the, the redos of your life, the things where you could wish you could go back and just maybe change that part of your life. That one thing you wish that uh, you could go back and, and do it over again. Or the things that happened to you that you wish the consequences or the, the, the lingering pain or the struggles that come from that could just be undone a little more easily. I don't know if you have any redos or undones in your life, um, but I've got my fair share of redos and undones that I would love to have back. You know, on a more comical side, um, uh, a few years ago when Mia and I were dating, I had a major uh, redo I wish I could go back and do differently, and it has everything to do with the ever so serious topic of ranch dressing. It's, uh, it's a terrible thing, you guys. But uh, we had just celebrated my brother's 21st birthday by going to a Cubs game at Wrigley Field, which I've also told my wife is the most romantic place on the face of the planet. She uh, tends to think differently than I do on that one, but uh, I'm, I'm kind of stubborn in that. So we left the game, and we went downtown Chicago and went to a, a deep-dish Chicago-style pizza place for dinner. And when you order pizza there, it takes 50 to 60 minutes to bake the pizza because it's so thick. And, and so uh, we thought we'd order some appetizers. So we got a veggie tray and it came to the table and me and I had only been dating for like two months at this time. And, uh, and she didn't know how catastrophically opposed I was to ranch dressing at the time. And I didn't realize uh, just how boisterous I was about that. So Mia, in, in just all of her servant-heartedness, uh, went ahead, got me a plate, and started dishing up some of the veggies on my plate, and then she poured some ranch dressing that came with it as just a dipping sauce. And I think I, like, blacked out at this part of the conversation because I don't remember what happened, but I, I asked Mia what happened because everybody has reminded me that I grossly uh, 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 responded in an in a, in a overdramatic kind of way. And, uh, and I guess what I've been told, and here's my redo, is that when Mia handed me this plate with such grace and compassion, uh, I saw the ranch dressing on the plate and I said, uh, no. I guess I had like this kind of like talk to the hand type motion which is just terrible thing to do to your girlfriend and, and certainly someone that's going to become your wife. And I have just gotten absolutely just, 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 just criticized over the last five years now because of how I reacted about ranch dressing. Something so stupid and so silly. Uh, everybody just gives me a hard time. I thought I probably said something in the lines of, oh, no, thanks. I don't really like ranch dressing. No, it was, uh, no, and I pushed the plate away. It was a terrible thing. I really wish I could go back and redo that one, you know? I also think about some of the more serious things, right? The, the, the things in my life where, uh, where, gosh, if I could just have known better or acted differently, or I wish I could undo some of the consequences of poor choices, right? I wish I could go back and redo some of my failures as a leader where I tried to do too much by myself, which led me to, it led me to being not enough or, or, or led, led me to always being, leaving people just short of what they deserved, because I tried to do too much myself, and when I tried to do too much for too many people, I never did enough for enough people. Does that make sense? Whereas I wish I would have done it differently where I would have entrusted and empowered and prayed for leaders and you and our church differently. Like the kind of wake up in the middle of the night, redo, or undone, where you just wish you could go back and do something differently. I don't know 
what all of your redos or undones might look like. But what I'm grateful for is that we don't have a church where we have to pretend like we don't have those. I'm grateful that I can come before you and confess some of those redos and undones, and you receive that with grace. I'm grateful that you can confess these redos and undones to each other and be received with grace and compassion. And what we find in the book of Acts is a whole lot of hope for people like you and me who got a lot of redos and undones. You heard Amy read from Acts chapter 2 just a moment ago. And I want us to just look back at those verses again for a moment. Acts chapter 2 verse 22. I mean, if you want to meet a group of people who got a major redo and really wish that some of the things they did could be undone, it's these people right here, the Israelites, the Jews who crucified the Savior of the world, the Son of God, Jesus. Look at verse 22. Peter says, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Let's just pause there for just a second. You ever feel like uh, your redos and undones, your past ever come back, and every time somebody brings it up, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a punch to the ribs. I mean, sometimes it's, it's way worse than that, right? It can, it can actually send you down a slippery slope. It can lead to depression. It can lead to putting you in a dark place. It can, it can be heavy. But let's just, let's just call it a, a punch to the ribs. When that, that past comes up, when, when somebody reminds you of where you were, when somebody reminds you of the incredibly poor choices you made somewhere along the way, man, it's, it's painful. And Peter, in this sermon to all of these Jews, he needs them to remember the pain of putting Jesus to death. He needs them to know that they're at fault for this. Right, this, is, this is a heavy dose of the law where it's, look what you guys did and guess what you probably deserve because of that. I mean, it's a straight shot to the ribs. Lots of pain, brings it all up. But then he says in verse 24, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Peter, in speaking to the Jews, gives them a little shot to the ribs, reminds them of their past, reminds them of the pain of something they probably wish they could go and redo or have undone in their life. And yet, what happens next is staggering. And what happens, unfortunately, is that too often people think the story with Jesus ends here. Where church is just around to give you a shot to the ribs. Remember what you did? Shouldn't have done that. Why'd you make that decision? Or that was 15 years ago. Why are you still bringing that up? Why are you still dealing? Can't you just get over it? Or can't you just kind of muster up some strength and press through it? Look what happens with the Jews here. Look down at verse 36. Peter says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. In verse 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, 
every one of you. Peter takes the pain and turns it into a path of redemption. What was a punch to the ribs is now a path to redemption, which means that for each and every one of us, the things along our our lives where it caused some pain, there's things we wish we could redo or have undone, the gospel actually undoes it and gives you second chances. The gospel actually sets you free of that. Now, here's here's what I love about this, this passage, because if you look back in verse 24, you see exactly how things are undone. You can't have something undone unless Jesus and his death is undone. Look at verse 24, and the language that that is used here is is beautiful. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death, and look at these words, to keep its hold on him. As if to say the past or the things that other people wish they could redo or have undone were were what what were holding him back or death itself holding him back, just like the things from your past that you wish you could redo or have undone might be holding you back or you feel tied to, you have a Savior who on your behalf was tied to a tree and tied to death itself in a tomb, but could not stay dead and was loosed from those things that tied him down. So that a bunch of people like you and me who have redos and undones might have those things undone and might have grace and hope and be set free of those chains. So what do the people do? How do they respond? What do we do when we encounter a savior who undoes the past? Peter says it in verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. And then in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Three things they do. They continue to practice repentance. They receive their baptism. And they commit to being in community as they follow Jesus together. When you encounter the power of the gospel that can undo the past that can cut you away from the things that have been holding you down. The right response is to repent. God, I hate the things in my past. I need your grace for the things in my past, and I need your strength for what's ahead. Repentance. Baptism. God working faith into your life that happens maybe at one moment in your life but impacts the rest of your life and always is something you can remember back to as God claiming me as someone whose path now is marked by redemption and community. What I find so remarkable is that studies have been done uh, that show, and they, they, they look at different uh, movements of the gospel around the world. They look for reoccurring themes or things that are happening in these movements that make it so, so viral in the way that the gospel spreads into people's lives. And the number one indicator of the growth of the gospel is that people repent and, and confess their sins to each other. Not They have the best programs or strategies or they do the most outreach things in the neighborhood. It's that they gather in community and they're real with each other about what's going on in their lives. There's no pretending. 
There's no walking into community and, and, and pretending like you don't have any redos or undones in your own life, right? If community, or as you look around the room and, and you don't know or don't feel connected to people in this room, I want to highly invite you to receive community that will bless you and love you right where you're at and not for where anyone thinks you need to be. If you're in community and you see folks in this room or in your neighborhoods or at your workplace and you know that they need community as well, extend the invitation of friendship to them. If during meet and greet today, you, you met somebody you hadn't met before. Invite them out for coffee or go to lunch with them today or, or have them over for dinner this week or meet up somewhere. Extend that invitation because in that community, God will humbly remind us that no matter how many redos or undones you have, that the gospel is for you. The gospel is for me. We got a whole lot of grace to give to one another. You know, I'm so hopeful for, what I'm so thankful for is that it's, it's those redos and undones covered by God's grace that make for incredible learning experiences. The things where I can't go back and redo or undo the consequences of poor choices or, or bad leadership or sin in my past. I can look back with grace and learn from those things. And you know what happens? Is that you tend to not think of those things so much as failures anymore, but instead opportunities just to learn and grow. And I find myself leading differently now. And I find myself praying differently now. I find myself seeking to understand and love the people that God has put in my life differently now than I did before. I seek to, to believe the gospel that the power of God can accomplish anything more. I understand more now that I am capable of nothing, but God in me can accomplish anything. 